You know how the latest USB specifications boast all these incredibly fast transfer speeds, like 5, 10, or even 20 gigabits per second? Well, you might be surprised to learn that those marketed speeds are effectively bogus, and it is literally impossible for you to actually copy files at each of those full speeds, but probably not for the reason you think. I'm sure we all know never to actually expect a USB flash drive or external SSD to have the up to speeds they claim, but it's not necessarily that those speeds are exaggerated by the manufacturer or are just for perfect conditions. Rather, the official USB speed specifications themselves are not quite true. Let's consider the first tier of USB 3, which these days goes by the name USB 3.2 Gen 1, or what most people know as USB 3.0 it has an advertised speed of five gigabits per second. But even if I use that to connect an external SSD capable of well over that speed as to not be the bottleneck, I only get about 3.6 gigabits per second or 450 megabytes per second. What gives? Well, first of all, the SSD, USB port and cable and computer are all working fine. The discrepancy comes literally from the USB protocol itself. That number around 3.6 gigabits per second or 450 megabytes per second is indeed the actual expected maximum transfer speed for so-called five gigabit per second USB. And it even says so in the latest official USB specification document, which if you weren't aware, the specification is decided by the so-called USB Implementers Forum or USB IF, who also brought you the big brain naming schemes such as USB 3.2 Gen 2x2. Now you're probably thinking, wait, so the USB IF are just outright lying about USB's transfer speeds? And to quote that one meme, well, yes, but actually, no. Before I explain that though, there is some good news, which is that at least the USB specs are accurate when it comes to the wattage ratings for USB power delivery, and it is capable of high wattages, assuming of course that you have a high quality charger that can handle it like from today's sponsor, Ugreen, and the new Ugreen Nexode 300 watt charger, which has five ports, including a single dedicated 140 watt output port. And this thing is a beast. With 300 watts to go around through four USB-C ports and one USB-A, it will even fast charge up to three laptops simultaneously. It has the power delivery 3.1 charging protocol, plus a ton of others, so it supports a huge range of voltage and amperage modes, meaning you can charge more devices at their fastest capable charging speed. And of course, the charging power is all automatically negotiated with the device, so you won't have to worry about hurting anything. It also has superior charging safety with its built-in thermal guard safety system, which monitors temperature changes in real time at 6,000 measurements per minute and keeps connected devices protected from overheating, overcharge, and excessive current. And to go a step further, it even has a flame retardant PVC shell for added fire safety and resistance to bumps and drops. By using the latest charging technology, with gallium nitride instead of older legacy silicon chips, it's more efficient, which is what allows for that small footprint with big wattage. So be sure to check out the link in the description to learn more about the Ugreen Nexode 300 watt charger. And with all that being said, let's continue. Okay, so on to why the speed is slower. You see, technically, if you were to somehow watch all the ones and zeros flowing across the USB cable, like with an oscilloscope or something, you would observe five billion ones and zeros going by per second. So this raw signaling rate, it's called, is literally five gigabits per second. But not all of those bits actually contain any information. And I'm not talking about metadata overhead used by the computer and device to coordinate the data transfer, that's separate. Rather, what's going on, and this is gonna get a bit technical, so bear with me, is that the USB protocol at the five gigabit per second speed at least, uses something called, and again, bear with me, 8B, 10B line encoding. I'll explain this as simply as I can, but what this means is that for every 10 bits transmitted, only eight of them are actually used for data and the other two are used to stick in extra ones and zeros to balance out the signal you can think of it like. You see, if too many zeros or ones occur in a row, the device or computer might lose count because they use transmissions between ones and zeros to keep their clocks in sync. So if there are too many ones or zeros in a row, there are extra bits that are added to artificially create a transition point. 
though I'm not gonna get into the specifics of how it chooses where to put those. This all means that even before any other overhead, only four gigabits per second of actual data flows across a five gigabit per second USB connection. And when you do consider other overhead, like from metadata or handshakes, you effectively end up with a real world speed, again, of around 450 megabytes per second or 3.6 gigabits per second, almost 30% less than what everyone expects. Now, I wouldn't expect them to change the name because of real data overhead, since it is still data and it does vary anyway, but an encoding scheme which physically reduces the bandwidth by a specific amount, come on. And to be clear, this is not the fault of USB device manufacturers. They have to use all the branding handed down by the USB implementers forum, which includes the literal product names, USB 5 gigabits per second and USB 10 gigabits per second. But hold on, because the type of encoding is different for other speeds like 10 gigabits per second USB. Oh, and yeah, this type of thing is not unique to USB, by the way. Later, I'll go over how a similar thing happens with SATA and PCI Express speed ratings. Though, you will be glad to hear that network speed ratings like gigabit ethernet are true speeds. So at least there's that. All right, now, like I said, with USB 3.2 Gen 2, or just USB 10 gigabits per second, it's slightly different. It still uses a line encoding scheme, but instead of 8B, 10B, it uses a much more efficient 128B, 132B line encoding. Therefore, 128 out of every 132 bits, or 97% of the signal, is actually for data. Therefore, that ends up being about 9,700 megabits per second, or 1.2 gigabytes per second. But the official USB spec document mentions that accounting for other overhead, the real world best case bandwidth is about 1.1 gigabytes per second. That's a difference of 12% compared to the stated speed. Not as bad, but I think still misleading. Now, I haven't even mentioned USB 2.0, which is supposed to be capable of 480 megabits per second or 60 megabytes per second. And I don't know about you, but this one especially always seemed exaggerated to me. I've never seen anywhere close to that speed for USB 2.0. And turns out there's a reason for that. No surprise. I'm going to keep this one shorter, but USB 2.0 uses a completely different type of encoding scheme called non-return to zero inversion or NZRI. I won't get into that, but it aims to solve the same problem that the others we mentioned do. But taking that plus the other overheads into account, USB 2.0 ends up having a real world maximum speed in the range of 30 to 40 megabytes per second. So basically half the stated speed. I knew it. As for USB 4, that's an interesting one. And because we all know how well thought out and intuitive the USB naming scheme is, I'm going to simplify the generations here a bit. So the original implementation of USB 4 has stated speeds of up to 40 gigabits per second. But in an upcoming updated version of USB 4, it will apparently be capable of up to 120 gigabits per second. Of course, a device still might only support the 40 gigabits per second mode. Anyway, USB 4 uses yet another encoding scheme called PAM3, which is way more complicated, but apparently according to one article, it is more efficient even than 128B, 132B encoding. I also read another article that says, if I'm interpreting it correctly, that it does 99% of actual data transmission, which seems to check out considering the 10 gigabit per second generation has a loss of just 3% from encoding. Also, I should point out that USB 4 has a ton of different data modes, and I'm not certain if you'll actually be able to use the full 120 gigabit per second bandwidth for copying a single file. That might only go up to 8 gigabits per second with the final lane of 40 gigabits per second, just chilling to be used by another purpose like DisplayPort. Okay, so I think we can finally move on from USB and deliver more unfortunate info, starting with SATA. I won't spend as much time on this one because it's less relevant with NVMe SSDs becoming so popular, but regardless, you might know that the latest version is SATA 3, which is actually really old and has a max speed of six gigabits per second or so it says. But in reality, SATA also uses that 8B, 10B line encoding scheme I talked about before, which means the true max raw bandwidth is 4.8 gigabits per second or 600 megabytes per second. But again, considering additional overhead, they really max out at around 550 megabytes per second. And if you've ever owned a SATA SSD, you might remember that probably being the max speed you would have seen. It wasn't the SSD, 
it was the interface. But wait, there's more, because not even PCI Express speeds are safe, though at least the difference here isn't nearly as bad as others we've seen. PCI Express versions 1.0 and 2.0 are ancient, so it doesn't matter, but they used 8B, 10B line encoding. But starting with PCI Express version 3.0, which you do still see, it has used 128 be 130 b which means only 1.5% is not used for data. And that also applies to version 4.0 and 5.0, which at the moment is the latest version you can find actually used on products. Realistically though, I don't think this one is enough to worry about and you'd probably never notice anyway. Finally, I want to touch on something I mentioned before, which is that network speeds, like you might see with one gigabit per second ethernet devices, don't have this problem. They still do line encoding, but the specs for the ethernet protocol and others actually define a raw speed that is higher to account for this. So that true final speed is the same exact speed as advertised. Imagine that. Now there is still some additional overhead from within the data that gets transmitted, which will vary, so you can't really account for that. But at least it's still data. And what's especially funny is that even the internet service providers, who are notoriously scummy, they still deliver to you the actual bandwidth they advertise after any line encoding. In any case, even though you might be annoyed by all this like I was, at least you know whose fault it is. If you don't see the speeds you are expecting from a USB device, check the max bandwidth it's getting. It could be due to the USB itself. Thanks again to Ugreen for sponsoring. Be sure to check that link in the description to learn more about the new Ugreen Nexo 300 watt charger. Let me know what you think down in the comments. I'd be curious how many of you also wondered why that advertised USB speed always seemed just out of reach. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it an absolute unit of a thumbs up and consider subscribing. I try to make videos twice a week, usually Wednesday and Saturday. If you wanna keep watching, the next video I'd recommend is this one where I talk about how to never wonder about a weird error code in Windows and what it means ever again. I'll put that link right here you can click on. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.